Hey everybody, my name is Caleb Winningham and welcome to my Apple Vision Pro Developer Primer Series. The purpose of this video is going to be to provide very clear, highly focused answers to very specific questions that you will have, more than likely, if you are working or thinking about working with this headset. Instead of going on a long 45 minute video tutorial building some really cool app, the point of this video is going to be to do a bunch of really small, highly focused chunks. That way we can break down the relevant information into chapters and if you're here looking for something specific, you can actually track that down pretty easy. On top of that, I can go really in depth with things that may not be super relevant for everybody, such as how do you work with Xcode, how do you connect Xcode to the device, uh, some of those more beginner questions. If you're more advanced, skip over those. And if you're not, then great, you're at the right place, right? So uh, I won't stall any longer. Really, really exciting time to be working with this headset. Hopefully, even if you're here for just one quick answer to something specific, this video is super helpful for you. And if it is, don't be afraid to subscribe, like. There's going to be a lot of content coming out uh, for this device in particular, among other tech sort of videos. So I uh, can't wait to see what you guys are building, and we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, everybody, so first question that we're going to hit in this series is how do I go about actually writing the code for my application for the Vision Pro? And the answer to that is, well, on your MacBook, which unfortunately you're going to have to have and using Xcode, which is the environment and application that Apple has made that they expect you to use for all sorts of Apple development, whether it's for the iPhone, whether it's for Apple TV, whether it's for Vision Pro, it's all gonna be on this one application. So on the screen here, we've got at developer.apple.com slash Xcode, uh, a little overview on what this application is. And again, uh, it's a developer environment. If you've worked with other coding languages, working things like websites, it's similar to things you may have used like Visual Studio Code, or something with JetBrains, but again, this is specific just to Apple products. So Xcode 15, you'll see a download button right here. We don't need the beta so much anymore, so we'll focus on just the major release. Should be the most stable. It'll direct you to an App Store link, which will open in the App Store. It's a little bit big, but again, if you're wanting to write code or build apps, you're gonna need this. So if you get to this page and you don't have it, go ahead and click Install, and when it's done, I'll catch you back here where we will open it up and make sure we're set up for coding. Okay, awesome. So it should be installed by now. And what we'll do first, again, is just open up Xcode. You'll land on this landing page here. All the other things that you've been working on will pop up here on the right-hand side. If you've been coding for a while, you can disregard those for now. We'll hit more of this as we go. But uh, the first thing you're going to want to do if you're brand new to having Xcode set up is make sure that you are configured well for working with Vision Pro. And to do that, I'm going to first jump up to Window and then go down to Devices and Simulators. This is where all your simulator environments are going to be. And this is what you'll be able to run code on if you have a headset you want to test quickly. Uh, it may be faster in a lot of cases just to push it straight to the sim and then save your actual device testing for later. Uh, if you have it, it's probably more fun just to work on the headset. But for those of you who don't have it, it's actually a pretty um, holistic environment for actually building and testing applications. So uh, no shame in building out Apple Vision Pro apps, even if you don't have a Vision Pro on hand, at least not yet. Uh, so you'll see for me, I have some watch OS simulators. I've got some iPhone simulators, some iPad, and I've got a couple vision pro or vision OS simulators. You likely won't have a whole lot of these. If this is your first install of Xcode and that's fine. So all you'll do is click this plus sign on the bottom. And this is how we'll actually add things to the vision pro or the Xcode environment for working with vision pro. You can look through here and you see, we have vision pro here on the bottom that may or may not be installed for you. And if it's not, you likely won't have an OS version. If you don't have anything in this block here, then that's fine. You'll click download more simulator runtimes and you'll see down here, Vision OS 1.0. I have it already, so it's not showing a Git link. I don't have tvOS. So if I wanted to work with Apple TV, then getting that installed would be a priority. And I don't have watch. So uh, for you, you'll likely see a bunch of these Git buttons. Make sure you look down for where the Vision OS simulator is, click install, and you should only need the, the main one here. So uh, if you see that, hit Git. It'll install. Again, they're pretty like large when it comes to size, but uh, again, necessary for this sort of work. It'll install, download the whole nine, and once that's ready, you come back, name it whatever you want. I already have one called Caleb VP, so I won't actually create it, but you'll hit create, and it will add that simulator to your environment. Now uh, that we have that confirmed that it's working, we'll jump back to Xcode. And if you want to build a Vision Pro app, what you're going to do is just click Create New Project, You'll see on the top here, we have all the different environments that you could build products for, whether that's iOS, Mac OS, Watch OS, and in our case, Vision OS. So we'll make sure we have that selected. We're gonna go ahead and click on app next, and we'll say this is just a starter app. 
The rest of this information uh, may say none. There may be something here may not be. Uh, I like to have it my own personal team on there for anything that's not company or business related. Uh, identifier is not going to be a huge issue right now. And the rest of this you can leave just the way it is for the time being. You'll click next. It'll ask you to save it. Click create. And you'll have the default app that they always dump out whenever you start a new Apple Vision Pro project with those settings, at least in particular. You should have a window now that has a canvas on the right hand side where you can see your changes uh, in near real time. This is what this code right here has communicated this screen to build out. Um, so if you've landed on this page here, you're in the right place. And if you want to test that this is actually pushing this correctly to your simulator, you can look by clicking on this uh, link right here, starter, click on the device, and we can just say, hey, run this on a simulator, and then all you do is click play. You'll see this build the application right here in the top right. We won't go too far into this for the portion of this video, but we should see in a moment here at least, this simulator window pop up. This will be a good indicator to know that again, all of our code's compiling correctly. Everything that we have installed is installed and working and communicating well with Xcode. And so long as the same window that we just saw in the bottom right pops up here for us, then we are in the right spot. So we'll see, it's loading in. Uh, really fun to play with these environments if you haven't already. Uh, a lot of cool things going on here, but yeah, our demo app is working. The buttons work as intended. Uh, so if you have anything like this where you're in a scene, you can render an immersive black environment where two other 3D spheres pop up, then you are in the exact right spot. And yeah, that's it for video one. So getting Xcode set up and installed, that's what it looks like. Okay, so next question is, how do I actually get code running on my physical in hand Apple Vision Pro if I already have one of those. If I don't want to run a simulator, I want to actually test all my changes in the actual headset. How do I set that up? Great question, and it is not intuitive at all as to how that would happen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, I guess, two split views here versus pulling up my desktop in my actual Vision Pro environment. There's going to be some things we do in the headset that we have to set up. There's going to be some things we have to do in the computer, and it's going to involve the headset restarting. So I'll show a couple clips there of just kind of what's going on. I'll show what's happening here in Xcode, and hopefully by the end of this quick segment, you'll be able to have yours connected up and running as well. Okay, awesome. So we'll go ahead and jump into the actual Vision Pro headset first for this one here. And what you're gonna wanna do is make sure you are on the General tab here on the left side of our Settings window. So we're in General, and we can just scroll down until we see this option for Remote Devices. We can select that, and you should see in here, unless you're already configured, this prompt that says Ready to Pair. This device is now discoverable and available to pair with your Mac. Now, we can move this window up. I'll jump down to my, down to my Mac view. Uh, so in here, you will see within this area that we were working on, the last question for simulators, that if we click on Manage Run Destinations, there are two tabs, one for simulators and one for devices. In this case, we want to ensure that we are pairing our Apple Vision Pro. So um, you'll see a prompt here. If you're not paired, to go ahead and click. It will ask you for a code, which will show up in your Vision Pro. And just like anything else you do with Apple, you just type in uh, what it wants you to for this two-factor authentication. And by doing so, which we've messed up, it will link your devices and allow them to communicate with one another. So better luck this time. We're connected, we'll see this pop up now as a device within this screen. And if we look back on our Vision Pro, now we have Kill's MacBook Pro showing up as a remote device. So step one of really two and a half, I guess, done. First is just making sure we're connected. So we'll jump back. And now the setting that we're gonna wanna look at is going to be down in privacy and security. And if you scroll all the way to the very bottom, there's an option under security for developer mode. So mine's on right now, yours will be off. This won't even be shown as an option until you are connected with your laptop, like we just did in the last second, uh, or the last minute or two of this video connecting. So this won't show up until that's done. Once it is, you'll have the option to toggle this on. When you do toggle it on, it will prompt you to restart your device. It'll actually do it for you, but you'll have to restart, it'll reboot in developer mode, and then the last thing you'll have to do is, and we'll just pull this down, in general settings one last time, we'll go to VPN and device management. Right now, there's nothing in here. If we look at my Mac screen again, we select our Apple Vision Pro, which will now show up in this device list as our intended destination for running the app. 
and click play, you will see this whole app build. And then we'll get this notice that the actual running of it failed. And in the headset, you'll see an even more explicit uh, failure reason when it talks about being an untrusted enterprise developer. So if you get that prompt, do not freak out. Click OK. In the same window that we were in a moment ago that was empty, we should now have a developer app requesting really for us to trust it as an actual um, account that pushes code to our device. So we'll trust your Apple ID. Boom, boom. And in doing so, we should be able to jump back to our Mac, hit run, have this app build in the headset. We should have a window pop up, which I have. It'll take a second to build up, and then boom, just like we saw in the simulator. A 3D object, we can enter an immersive space, all black, everywhere around us, run the void, two more spheres floating in the distance. And yeah, we've got code working uh, in terms of being able to push Chromex code to our device, and we're primed to start working on our own projects. So uh, yeah, second question in the books, let's move on. Okay, so next question. How do you actually go about displaying content, information, your app at large? How do you get what you're making actually in front of the user? What are the ways of doing that? And this will really be more of an overview portion of the video for some terms that I'm sure you've heard a few times but maybe haven't actually seen how you set those up or what those mean in context. But a uh, quick overview here and then we'll jump into code. If you go to the Vision OS landing page, so just the first thing you go to in the documentation from Apple, developer.apple.com slash vision OS, you'll see this gorgeous photo of a Vision Pro, and then right below it, the very first thing it does is make clear what separates these items. So you have three major categories. You have Windows, and you can think of Windows just like you think of a computer window. Uh, traditionally, it's pretty flat. In the Vision Pro, you can layer items out, add some depth to it, so it has more of that 3D effect, but everything is more or less uh, connected and oriented specifically to a rectangle sort of view. It's the ones that you'll see with the glossy uh, sort of background, and that's more standard. You can set different colors for that, but uh, for now, that's what you're looking at in terms of what a window is. In the demo app that we've created and touched a few times, uh, and really that's just the one that comes standard when you create a project, it's the very first one that you see with a 3D sphere on the top and a button that says show uh, like immersive style, right? So that is a window. You can think about it just like a rectangle with all your content aligned. In this view here, it'd be like the purple, the blue, and the red. Next is a volume. So volumes are really, really helpful for positioning 3D space or 3D objects in a space that's still confined by some sort of boundaries. And in this one, this cube's a great example. It's still got that window sort of control style to it. There's no longer a backdrop. You can still collect or select that little bar on the bottom, I'll zoom way in here, and bar on the bottom to position that object, but it's going to be presented inside of almost like a cube. And it's a great way of thinking about it. You can position your object anywhere within there. It no longer has, again, that strict backing that you're used to seeing with a window, but it's not quite an immersive scene where you're positioning objects in all sorts of space. It's still constrained by a presentation style of view. And in that same vein, we have spaces. So spaces are the extended version of that. If we take the walls off the cube, make the world our cube in a way, then we are in an immersive space. So what makes spaces really unique is there's three styles of how immersive those spaces can be. You have mixed, which would be if I had like this room in a mixed style, it would be me putting 3D objects around my room. Maybe I have some 3D vases or I have like a picture frame I would hang on the wall. In an immersive space that's mixed, my room still looks the same, pass is going for the most part, and I'm positioning objects across this normal looking world. Progressive is the almost like Goldilocks bear, it's the perfect middle. You can decide just how immersed you want to be or not be. On the built-in environments, an example of this is when you twist the dial in your headset, when you're on like the moon, you can have it to where you're fully on the moon, which would be a full immersion style, which is the last style we'll talk about, or you can have it, you know, 10, 20% of the way where maybe your front field of view is mostly the moon, but everything else looks normal. So uh, with a progressive view, you're really just letting the user decide how immersed they are into some sort of virtual environment. In this case, less so the passive environment where you're positioning objects, more so uh, dipping their toes into like a fully consuming world. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum is again, that full immersion style, which for a user, if selected, it's going to let them be fully somewhere else, and it does not let them lower that level of immersion. So if you say you have a fully immersive scene, when a user enters that scene, they are there. They can't uh, dial it down to where only the front is or the back is. It'll be them fully on the moon if they're on the moon 100%. So 
Different ways of thinking about it. That's what that looks like. But how do you actually set that up? Great question. What we'll do is I will actually just create a new project. Here we have just the standard setup we've done a few times. I'll send this one example. Didn't change any options. Hit create. It's going to go ahead and load up. And we have exactly what we're used to seeing every other time here. It looks like we have, I'll let myself down, there we go. <laughs> looks like we have some errors, it's never the case, it's always just building for the first time. And again, this is our window view with a 3D object poking out just a little bit, still a window. And we have our ability to turn on an immersive space, which in this case is actually just two floating spheres. And we won't be able to see that in here too well. Um, if we look at our reality kit content here in that package, this is what it looks like, right? So two floating spheres. And when we enter that in the app, we tend to be completely in the dark as a fully immersive scene with two spheres. So let's break down really quickly how to set up each of these. If we go to example app here, you will notice a couple things. Uh, first thing I'll point out is we navigate directly to this first window group, which is what we set up when we created the app. You can specify that you want to go straight to an immersive scene. Traditionally, the best guidance for, from Apple for these sorts of apps is to always land the user on a window, allow them to toggle an immersion so they don't get confused as to how they arrive somewhere. So this is our window group. And again, you will see that this links to this content view file. We have a V stack, which is just a vertical arrangement of content with a model, some text, and a toggle to turn on this immersive space. The immersive space here Again, it's where we tell it which scene to use. The one that, in this case, is being used is the one with two spheres. But all of the configuration for that is happening here in the root level file. So example app, we have selection, constant.full, in.full. And this is where we can say we want it to be progressive, if we want it to be progressive, and mix if we want it to be mixed. And in this case, mix wouldn't be too useful just because uh, it drops you right into a dark environment already. But Progressive will be an interesting change because previously we couldn't lower that immersion style with a dial if we wanted to, and now in theory we should be able to, which is great. So we have a window group, we have an immersive space, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to copy this uh, for the volume view. So we have a window, an immersive space, and what we're going to do here is we're going to define a window style, and that style is going to be, you guessed it, volumetric. So there isn't like a special volume group or anything like that for displaying a volume. It's going to be within a window group with the window style set to volumetric. And what I will do for this one is just create a new view called, called volume view. I'm going to copy everything that's inside of the content view into a new file here. We'll call it, again, a Swift UI view. This will be volume. View. We'll go and create that. We can drop it up here so it's close with everything else, all its friends. <laughs> and then uh, we'll just replace everything in here with what we had already. And instead of content, this will be volume. And we will get rid of pretty much everything that's not a 3D object. So for this case, I'm just going to cut out the model 3D, kill literally everything else that's in here, and have just this model. 3D object in here, and in this case, that is just that sphere, black sphere object. So our volume will just be the sphere. In the content view, what I'm gonna do is, you see these two environment variables here for opening and closing an immersive space. You guessed it, we're gonna add two that just do window controls. So we don't wanna open another immersive space, we wanna be able to open a window. And I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll actually just do the open aspect, because this will be a quick demo. You can do the same thing with dismiss, just like you've seen here. And what I will do is add just a quick button here, which allows us to open the window. And we're going to pass in an ID. And we will label this with a text object here. It says open, uh, not window, volume. Now, you notice I didn't put anything in this ID area now, and that is because we did not set an ID for this window group. And this is how we're going to be able to reference these things down the road. So I'll, I'll add an ID now, and for this one, I'll just call this volume. So when we open the immersive space, we're looking for an immersive space with this ID. Same thing's going to happen when we open this volume. So 
the immersive space is opening the one with the ID immersive space. Our volume will open the one that has the ID volume. So that's how it looks right now. You'll see on our view here, we now have another nice button that's been placed on the screen. And we will go ahead and run this in our simulator. I'll show it to you here first. It won't be as powerful as it being in the headset. So I'll run it here first and then quickly demo it again in the headset so you guys can see what that looks like on there. So it's launching. We will see in just a moment. That is not the right thing. Here we go. We will see this come on up. And again, we have open volume, show immersive space. So here we are with our window. We'll go ahead and open a volume. And you'll see now, let's make sure to grab it, that we've got, where are you at, remote controller? We've got, there it is. We've got this volume now. So this sphere exists in 3D space. You can think of, about it as like having a 3D cube around it. I can still drag it around. Looks like a little Quidditch ball right now, which is kind of fun. Uh, but again, different example than a window because if you picture what's really common in the examples, something like a planet here, you can have a volume with a planet in it with things orbiting that uh, object. You can set up anything really that you want in there. It's just a way of presenting controlled 3D content, which is really exciting. And then again, the same other item we have here, which is to show this immersive space. It's going to warn us about our surroundings. And here we are. We've got this immersive space in here now, and we've got our objects still on the side. So uh, different ways of showing content. I'll show you quickly now in the headset, and then we will jump on to something new. So let me pull it up really quickly. We'll jump back over here. Vision Pro. And then we will hit, once I log in, or it'll tend to have a hard time, then we will hit to build and go. I'm gonna go ahead and push to my device. We will see this window loading up with our app. It'll push through here. And again, we should see, there we are, one 3D object on a window. So this is our window. We notice that this has some depth to it, that object on there. But it is assigned and pinned really to that same position on the window. It doesn't move much. Uh, just provides a way of adding some 3D effect to an otherwise pretty flat area. If we hit to open the volume, we'll see that we have the same sort of window controller style here. So I can grab it. I can move it around and talk about a uh, golden snitch here. We've got a full on 3D object moving however we would like it to. So uh, again, very, very, very basic example here for what this could look like. And a lot of other demo apps that Apple's made or others have made, there's like planets with things orbiting, like satellites or things like that. But uh, in this case, just a simple orb example. I'm trying to get this closed, but it's a little close. There we go. And then lastly, we'll go ahead and jump in this immersive space. And you'll remember that we made this uh, one where it is progressive now in terms of immersion. So if we look to the left and right, we no longer have full black around us on the sides. And that is because we are only progressively in the scene. If we turn the dial on our headset all the way up, we are now fully in the scene. And if we turn it down, we can get to where we have pretty minimal uh, immersion. And this one looks like it caps at about right here. But again, this is a good way of offering your user the means of completely tailoring their level of immersion and their overall experience with your app using some of the built-in controls. So those are the three ways of presenting content. Hopefully that helps put a little bit of background context as to what to expect. And we'll move on to the next question. Thanks. Okay, awesome. So next question is this. How do I go about working in immersive spaces? Is there a good on-ramp for that? How do you work with things like environments? How do you work with things that are fully immersive or progressively immersive? And that's a great question. The answer to that that I'm going to take, I guess, pathwise in order to give you a good explanation is we'll talk about skyboxes. How you work with skyboxes is a great way of touching immersive scenes right away. It gives you a good overview as to how they work, what you can do with it, and how effective little things are in the grand scheme of creating an immersive environment for your user. So in this case, I've already actually <laughs> created the demo app. Won't create that with you here on the screen. Same thing. Haven't changed anything in this view or the content view. So it'll be the same standard show immersive space window, except in immersive view, I've taken out everything except for the bare bone body here. So reality view, content in, then nothing else. And what I'll do is just progressively reveal what was in here. So I've got a function here that creates a skybox. And for those of you who aren't aware, I'll have some examples, I guess, playing right now as to what these are, what these look like. But the long story short of it is the Vision Pro is able to display a 360 degree image very effectively. 
and with that in mind, you can take 360 degree images and warp them around the user to make them feel like they are in the center of a new sort of world or environment. So in this case, we've got a function to create a skybox, which is the name for these 360 degree images that surround a user. And this is basically how it works. So if you think about the skybox as a sphere, as like almost like a globe, except the user, instead of being on the outside looking at a globe, they're at the dead center of it. We say, okay, users inside, a big dark sphere. What can we do if it's hollow to make it feel like somewhere else? Well, we'll take these 360 degree images and we'll just place it on the inside of the sphere. So that's what's happening here. We're putting the user inside of a big object and we're putting an image around the inside of it. So they're seeing an image applied in the form of a texture to the inside of a sphere. And to them, it looks like they're looking at a whole different sort of world. And this is the way we do it. So. Here, instead of creating an actual scene in Reality Kit, which is where you can actually hand design all your objects, all your sorts of uh, 3D models, all your audio, things like that, we are going to create this all programmatically. First thing we're going to do is create a large sphere by getting a mesh resource and generating a sphere with a radius of whatever you want. In this case, it's in meters. I selected two because the uh, moving distance for a user wearing the Vision Pro is really minimal. If you move even just a little bit, you start to get warnings and you have less immersion because it's worried about you hitting something. So uh, a radius of two meters all the way across four meters is plenty of space for this use case it felt like. So that's what I have set as. Feel free to increase or decrease as you desire. The thing to keep in mind is your image is going to have to fill the inside of this object. So the bigger it is, the more stretched your image might look, and the closer it is, the more high def it might look. But if it gets too close, it also doesn't feel too immersive. So set that value however you like. Uh, we're going to add an unlit material to, uh, or we're going to define a skybox material as an unlit material, just a way of setting almost like an initial material for this actual object. And then we're going to get our texture. And the way that I've done this here, I uh, said so let my texture equal, try to get a resource and load it named demo. And in my case, I dropped an image called demo. Let's see if I can get this any bigger. Nope. I dropped an image called demo into my asset folder. If you don't have a 360 degree image, what I love doing is jumping over to Blockade Labs. If you haven't heard of this, it's really cool. It's like a ChatGPT style uh, text input sort of box here, but it creates 360 degree images. So in this case, let's say I want a spooky graveyard at nighttime. And I can use this improp enhanced prompt sort of style. You can click different uh, versions of what you want this to look like. I tend to really like, let's see, I'll look a little bit here, render. The stylized CGI realism. I feel like it looks really bright and uh, just fine. The fine line of almost like cartoony. So we'll hit generate. It'll take 15, 20 seconds. And again, if you have a 360 degree image, feel free to use whatever you already have. This is just a really fun way of doing something a little bit more custom. I thought it'd be fun for the sake of this uh, tutorial. So while this is downloading, we'll give it another couple seconds. This one's not a bad one either, honestly. It looks really cool. Big wide open sort of desert area. And again, 360, so you can go all the way up and all the way down. And this one's great too, because the top didn't look that confusing. So, okay, here we are. A little bit of a spooky graveyard feel. Lots of tombstones. And it is definitely dark. So, uh, cool 360 degree image here. I will select download. I will do PNG. This one takes a second usually to download as well, but again, a minute spent here for something that's truly custom. I think you get a couple, maybe it's 10 or 20 free attempts at doing this per month, which is pretty cool. And we have that now here. I will click it. I will bring it into my assets. And I will name this one um, Demo 2. So we'll go back to this immersive view. Again, we have the skybox. We ask for demo, I'm gonna update this to demo two. And then we set the color to this texture. So we have an unlit material, the material's not doing anything really. And then we have our texture, which is what's applying this uh, image that we just downloaded to the actual object. And right now that image is gonna be on the outside of the sphere. So if we were able to look at this right now, it would be a sphere with that image wrapped around it. And we've set the color now to that. If it doesn't work, then we'll error out, but shouldn't be a problem. And then now we just create the entity to place in the scene. So 
Uh, we said we want to create an entity called Skybox Entity. We want to set the components to, uh, we want the mesh to be the large sphere, which we define up top. And we want the materials to be uh, on the material that we then apply this texture to. So we have a sphere now completely uh, wrapped with this image. And the last thing we'll do before returning it is we will just take it and we will invert the sphere. So again, this is the user being inside the sphere. How do we get them to see this uh, image? Well, we create the skybox environment, wraps on the inside, places them in the center. And this is what is inverting that right now for the user. And then we return this. And up here in the reality view, all we have to do now, oh no, what have I done, is uh, let skybox equal create skybox. And then we will go content.add skybox. We will see if we get any errors. Okay, there we go. We'll run this now in the simulator. We've added the skybox to it. We'll see if it builds for us. If it does, we'll have it popping up here in just a moment. Here we are, we're in the space. I say show immersive space, and wow, here we are now on the inside here. If we look around, it is a trippy sort of environment. And again, it doesn't communicate quite as well in the headset. It's definitely still interesting, or on the simulator, excuse me. But I'll jump in the headset in a second, and I'll show you what this looks like in there. And I'll be curious to see what you guys make if you do this as well. So uh, give me one second, we'll boot up, and we will show you what this looks like inside. Okay, here we go, we have it loading up now. I'll keep my head still so we don't get motion sickness. <laughs> okay, so now when we click Show Immersive Space, it should bring us to the center of the sphere. And here we are. Ooh, and it definitely looks a lot better in the headset. Definitely cool vibe in here. And again, uh, very easy to do. You can make that image that gets loaded in here dynamic. So you can switch the environment a lot if you're a user. But yeah, really cool. I think first kind of step towards working with immersive scenes shows you how easy it is to really ramp up from nothing into something pretty cool. And we'll talk, I guess, next about layering more things into this, like uh, weather or sound. So. Uh, Next question. Okay, so next question, how do we make an immersive scene feel even more immersive? Specifically, how do we work with audio to help heighten the sense of immersion with our user? Great question, and in this case, we'll go ahead and just start right away by creating another blank application for the Vision Pro. We'll call this one Sound. I'm feeling really creative. And while this loads up, I will caveat that if you're following along with any of these, you will eventually run out of abilities to push to your device if you haven't paid for a developer account, but you can just delete things that we put on there already. So all the small apps you put on there, if you delete them, you'll stay under your quota. It looks like you have four or five on there without running into any issues, but if you're not paying for that $99 license to have a full-on developer account, then uh, just delete what's on there uh, from your custom apps if you're running into any errors. But okay, needless to say, now we're in the app. Again, nothing crazy here. Hello world, show immersive space, the whole nine. We will jump right over to the immersive view. And once again, I'm gonna go ahead and cut out everything that's not imperative to this. So we'll take out the image-based lighting, nothing wrong with that, but we'll just keep the two spheres in there for now. It'll be the two spheres in the black environment and we will focus more so in this case on audio. So if we jump over to reality kit content, this is where all of our scene data is stored. Again, we've seen this one quite a few times with two spheres floating in the abyss. But now when we look at this, so again, packages, reality content, package, we can open this in Reality Composer Pro. Now, Reality Composer Pro, if you aren't aware, uh, in terms of like a 10 second overview, this is where you compose all of your immersive scenes. So if you're working with 3D objects, if you're working with sound, if you're working with particles, it's all gonna be in this bad boy here. You can do a lot programmatically as well, but for ease of use, it's good to hop into this project browser, uh, Reality uh, Kit Content, Reality Composer Pro, and just work with your scenes this way. So for this instance, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is just create a brand new scene. Since we're working with audio, I will name this audio controller. 
.usda, and this is like the file format that we're expecting from scenes. I believe it's either a .usda or a .usdz. Uh, these are both, I think, originally Pixar standards for how they go about animating scenes. Obviously, it's morphed a ton since they came out with that standard, but um, used now with Apple scenes in particular, there is a wide range of things that you can use, but for the sake of this demo, we'll stick with what's expected and kind of tried and true, which is this .usda structure. So again, nothing in our scene, but we don't really need anything in our scene in this instance. We're only worried about audio. So we'll look up here in the sidebar. This is where all of our objects will go for the scene that we are working on. Since we're not adding anything physical, what I'm going to do is add audio. So we've got a couple different uh, options here for what audio can be added. We've got channel audio, which is almost like normal audio. If you think about like uh, just sound occurring, not really coming from anywhere. It's just sound coming straight to your ears. That's channel audio. You've got ambient audio, which is like uh, your ambient noise. You can hear uh, pluses and minuses coming through. Uh, one side is maybe louder if you're facing something specific. Um, but generally, there's audio happening around you. It's just a little bit more heightened in terms of that immersion feel. And then spatial audio is where you're hearing the knock on a door that's over there, something where you can channel audio directly towards the user very specifically. Uh, the way that you'll set up all of these audio files are pretty similar. Um, there's a little bit of tweak with something like spatial audio where you have to give a direction. But for the sake of this demo, we'll focus on ambient audio, uh, just because it's a little bit more complex in channel. Uh, adds a little bit more. Oh no, what have I done? Try some time. That's a little bit more to the scene. So ambient audio. There we go. Ambient audio is under our root uh, portion of the scene. And you'll see right now there's really nothing in it. You can set where the ambient audio is coming from. Not, again, super relevant right this second because ambient audio tends to surround the user. Uh, but we don't have anything actually playing yet. This is just the means of playing something if we have something to play. So you can download a, a sound, you can put rain noise in here from YouTube, you can uh, go out there, find a MP3 file, something like that. Uh, but built into this already, we can look, and we've got, if you click this top right plus sign, a ton of 3D objects in here you can play with, and I'm sure we will at some point with this demo series, but, uh, on top of that, you've also got things like your audio library. And we'll just jump now to atmospheres. These are some of the more chill ones, I'd say. You got sea in here, seagull, well cry. But for right now, let's just do atmospheres ocean. We will drag this into the scene. And what's great is you can configure a lot about your audio files when you're in here. This is the preview. I'm not sure if we'll even hear it, but it sounds like waves crashing on the ocean. Pretty nice. Uh, very relaxing, but we'll pause that on some options that you'll see on here right away. We do want this to loop. It's only 13 seconds long, so we want to play over and over, and we also will randomize the start time. So if a user's in here working on something in their immersive environment, and we want them to be there for a long time, or they come here often, we don't want them to always have the same exact sequence, so this helps keep people a little bit more on their toes. It randomizes when things start and stop, and yeah. So I don't know. Simple scene. We have our root. We have our ambient audio controller, and then we have our actual sound that's being played. So with this in mind, we will save. And you, when you save, you'll see the little yellow dot that was by that go away, just like you would with a lot of other things. We'll jump actually to our code again. And we will head back to this immersive scene. Now, what I'll do is let's go ahead and paste what I want to talk through versus like pretending to type it for you here again in a second. And we have the audio actually playing. So I'm just gonna kill the sound for now. <laughs> um, and let's talk through what we've added. So it starts right here. And in this case, we're adding just another entity. And in this case, it's not two spheres floating up in space. It is this audio controller that we defined in that scene just a moment ago. So we wanna create this entity by fetching uh, asynchronously this audio controller aspect of the scene we just made. So we tell it we want the audio controller and uh, that's the scene name. If it exists, it'll bring it down. And if it doesn't, then it won't. But in our case, it should exist. It does exist. And that's great. So it'll return this entity. And then here, we want to find within that scene this ambient audio uh, controller that we added. So when we clicked on the bottom left-hand plus sign, added that ambient audio, that's what it's looking for. That's what we're providing. Then we define the audio file name. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Uh, just in terms of how this gets referenced. I can show you guys later a good way of seeing what this looks like if you're having trouble having this actually find it correctly. But in our case, we know it's slash root because it's in that root portion of the scene slash atmospheres ocean. 
for a lot of these, you'll have to also include, like, uh, if you add your own, like, MP3, it'll be, like, the rest of the sound for that. But in our case, we don't, now we're having troubles because it's trying to play something that doesn't exist. Okay, but Root Emissor's Ocean, we don't need the MP3 uh, ending of that. And then, this is where we kind of all wrap it up. We define a resource, we try to define an audio file resource, providing that file name, where we can find the file, which is again in that scene that we defined in our reality kit content bundle. If it doesn't find it, we have an error, but again, this is just pointing straight back to this scene here. Root slash amateurs ocean, that's our file. The scene is called audio controller, and the ambient audio controller is within that scene. Once we have that, we will ask it to prepare the audio and then we will ask it to play the audio. And once we have it all configured, we'll add it to our content scene. And that's why we play it in a second here and we'll do it again in simulator first so we can feel a little underwhelmed and then we'll do it in the actual headset so we can see a little bit more as to what it might feel like to be overwhelmed with how good it is. So it's a pretty quick show immersive space. I don't know if it's registering my clicks right now. There we go. Come on. Gotta love this sim. Okay, let's just restart this. Always something. Okay. What are we missing here? time. Oh, that will explain it. We didn't have the right thing clicked. Okay, so we've asked to select it. Don't show me again. And here we are. Simulator, we'll turn the audio on. And I don't know if you can hear that in my microphone, but we've got some pretty loud ocean noise playing pretty cool. Uh, it feels a little flat again. On this one, it feels almost like channel audio coming out of the computer. But what I will do is I will go ahead and I will run it on the Vision Pro. So give me a second to ramp this up again. And we will show the immersive space. Don't show again. And then, yeah, you probably won't hear this again either, but it's coming out my actual headset speakers now. It feels really nice, really mellow. Uh, definitely feels like I'm a little bit more present, even though it's just a big black sphere for now. Uh, but just a way of heightening, I guess, the feeling that you're actually in this sort of area. So, uh, pretty cool. Well, we'll exit that. We will close. And, yeah, that is working with audio. And, again, the other ones are going to be really, really similar. So, I just encourage you, if you're interested in this at all, go ahead and keep pressing with working with the different types. And, yeah, that should be a good start, hopefully, for anyone wanting to work with audio. Cool. On to the next. Okay, and now for the last video, at least of this first sequence. Okay, and now for the last video of this first sequence of questions for the Apple Vision Pro developer. Uh, how do you further increase the immersion of an Apple Vision Pro immersive scene using particles? And particles in this example and in many others are going to be used to simulate things like weather, although they could be used for a million other things. That's what we'll work through today. Uh, so same old, same old, we'll create a new project. We will call this one weather. And we will jump right in. Okay, so we have our scene building. Surprise, surprise. A fake out there with Radicate content. Nothing really wrong. I will do what I've been doing and I will cut out all the fluff here. Just keep the two spheres coming up for now in that black environment. And we will jump down back into this. Ooh. Floating Orb Caleb into this Reality Composer Pro application. So we're back here where we're hoping to work on a new scene. And same thing, kind of like with sound. I'm going to create a new scene here. And we can call it, in this case, just snow. Uh, snow. It's a fun one. 
It doesn't have to be snow for you, obviously, um, but I will close this scene out, make sure we open up the right scene here, snow, and we will look to add a particle emitter. Now, the long story short of particles is you have a bunch of tiny, tiny objects that can be used uh, from an emitter, which releases them to accomplish some sort of intended uh, visual outcome. Again, it could be things like bubbles, it could be things like fireworks. The six that come kind of baked into Reality Composer Pro are fireworks impact, which is like fog or clouds. Uh, you have magic, which is just a bunch of sparklers, rain, snow, and sparks. So uh, these are the six that are in here now, but it could be really anything that you're emitting a ton of things for. Common example from Apple was using particles, I think it was sparks, to make it look like a rocket 3D model was taking off, so they attached an emitter to the bottom of that. But long story short, it's a really, really effective way to create an atmospheric sort of presence because you can control thousands and thousands and thousands of tiny visual objects. Uh, but in this case, we are going to click snow, and you'll notice right away some things are set up pretty well for us. We have an emission duration that loops, which is good because it We'll just keep going until we exit the immersive scene. You can change a lot of things about where it's coming out of, how it looks, uh, the birth location, the birth direction. Uh, right now, the emit direction is set to negative one Y, which means it's coming down, which is what we want. Uh, and we want it to be emitting, so we don't have to start or stop this. Uh, the one thing that we'll look at here is it doesn't really do us a whole lot of good for this particle emitter to exist straight on the ground of where we would be sitting otherwise. So um, the snow would be going out our feet, which isn't quite the immersive experience we're looking for. Uh, so we'll go ahead and bump this position uh, scale into feet. Could be meters, we can just do meters. And for this case, let's go ahead and set it just to two, and that should raise us up. We'll zoom out. About that high in the air. So about six feet in the air, sitting down. For most people, that's just above their ceilings. I would say another foot or two, so it'll look like it's coming down through the ceiling once it's fully ready to go, or about that height, which is perfect. So we will save this for now. Again, the emitter is pretty well set up for us. You can change a lot here to fine tune things, uh, but we wanna look now at the particles. So we have particles with a birth rate and a burst count. A lot of these can be expanded to add some variation, so it's a little less consistent, but. For our case, we want it to be heavy snow, so we'll add more of these particles. So instead of just 500 flakes of snow coming down, we've got uh, 1,000. And if we click play here, that's kind of what we're looking at. Now, what you'll notice right away is the snow is pretty clumped together, and it's also not falling all the way to the ground. So there's a couple things we can do to fix that. The first is we can adjust the size of the emitter to be a little bit bigger. So if we double the size of this in all aspects, we should have a much wider grid. And we could probably do that one more time to have a pretty wide uh, like range of where the snow is actually falling. Now, the problem with the snow not hitting the ground still is happening. And the reason for that is you actually have to define the size, which is not what we're looking at now, but the lifespan. Uh, the lifespan in this case is only set to three seconds. So that's not gonna really work for us. I'd say three seconds is getting us about a third of the way. So if we set it to 12, we'll just wait a second to see. Now we've got more coming down into the actual scene. Again, we wanna get it close to the actual ground. Are we getting close enough? And I think at this point, if we're falling for 12 seconds and still not hitting the ground, which we're starting to scratch it a little bit, but we're not quite there, the battery's getting low, is we will actually look at this emitter and say maybe we're a little too high. So if we put this down to 1.6 meters, see how that feels. We will see if the snow makes it down closer to where we maybe hope or expect it to hit. So we're getting good spread on the flakes. And I'd say, yeah, this is a lot closer to what we actually want when it comes to having these live long enough to actually reach the user. So that looks good. Some of the other options that you can look at here, at the particle, excuse me, portion. Again, we have a 1,000 coming in bursts. Uh, you can set the size. These look like pretty good size flakes. So I won't actually increase those too much. You can add variation, which is where it maybe gets a little bit more fun. So we'll add the potential for really big or really small flakes. Um, lifespan we've already set, 
we'll go another two seconds on there because it looks like some of them are getting to the bottom, but not all the way. And then here's the cool thing you can add with like some wind. And we'll bump this up to 0.5. And this will add a little bit more variety of just how much we're having the wind spread out some of these flakes. So uh, you can add vortex, uh, an attraction aspect of it, and this one is more of that noise, which is wind in this case. So we'll save this, which is cool, and it's really easy from there on to work with it in our immersive view. So we'll jump back to the immersive view. Again, we chopped out everything that doesn't really seem to be all that relevant, and we will just paste in, or I'll just paste in this quick little closure. And all this is doing is it's saying, hey, I want to add another scene. Can you please fetch the scene called Snow from my bundle? And if it doesn't find it, then it'll give us this error, but it should find it because we just made it. And then it will add that to the scene, uh, to our content scene, where we already have the two spheres. So we have this all in here now. If we run play, have it actually sent to the simulator. This will load up once again. We will click to show the immersive space. Don't show me again. And here we are. And these flakes look actually pretty dang big. So I think our quick lesson will be, hey, we can raise this up a little bit more and we can lower the size of the flakes because they're pretty big. So we'll go ahead and jump out and do that. Before we go, we'll leave this space. Still looks really cool. Oh, it's the conundrum with my mouse not working. Okay. But we'll go back. We'll jump into Reality Composer Pro again. And our two quick fixes will be we will raise this back up to where we had it before. If not, go a little bit higher. And then we will look at the particles and we will make them a lot smaller. So size, we'll go another decimal place and we'll just see if those look too small now but yeah in our quick glance there they were really big so we'll jump back into the vision pro this is the quick really kind of fun way of interacting with the particles again you get a lot of effect really quickly which is fun so we'll enter here and this time they'll be a lot higher so we'll see if they start falling yeah so again lesson learned here is we probably bring them a little bit lower the flakes are maybe a little bit small, but I guess that's probably pretty realistic for what you'd expect from snow. If you're in a snowstorm. And it looks pretty decent in the simulator, actually, but in the headset, I'm excited to see what it looks like even more. So what I'll do now is I'll just stop this for the time being. I'll make one last quick tweak with the scene before we hop in the headset, and that's just to uh, I'm going to lower it down just a little bit because it took a while for it to get to us. We'll go 2.2 meters, and then the particles, what I'm going to do is bump up the size one more time, which is ironic because I know we just were in here. We will go 0 0.005, and I'll decrease this little variation actually, and then size over life, math, lifespan. What I want to slow down a little bit is just some of that speed. So let me see. Lifespan, angle, velocity. So we'll bump this down in half. Cool, and what we'll do for this one is we've seen it in simulator twice. It looked pretty good last time. We'll go ahead and jump right into the Vision Pro with this, see how it looks, and then, again, uh, kind of wrap up our first iteration of these videos, see if they're helpful for you guys, and we'll go from there. So I'm in the headset now. We'll start loading up. Should be our same old, same old landing page here. And we'll show the immersive space. Don't show again. And we should be immediately greeted by, ooh, ton of these little snowflakes. So these actually look pretty trippy in here. I think uh, still a fun immersive scene. They spread out pretty well by the time they hit you, but a little bit more dense initially than maybe what we were looking for, but it actually feels really trippy right now. And again, maybe not super unrealistic for what a normal actual snowy scene would look like. So, uh, you know, iteration of this next would be maybe spreading them out one more time, widening that, or at least raising this up again. But I'd say, especially from here on out, like the snow actually looks pretty decent.
combine this with some of the sounds we already had, maybe a windy one for snow or a carol or something, uh, you're in pretty good shape for what this could look like. So yeah, there we go. Adding particles that you're seeing. And we'll say ready break. Just like that, we've got about an hour of content for this first run through with the headset. That's a total guess, maybe close to half an hour, I'm not totally sure, but a little bit longer than I was anticipating when I set out to make this, but hopefully a lot of good information in there for you guys. I know it was really, really uh, friction filled for me when I got started with things, uh, trying to figure out some of the finite like notation for how Swift liked to work, how you actually write things, how you fetch things, how you render things in a scene especially. So uh, learned a lot more since then, but figured I'd get the basics out there. If this is helpful for you guys, let me know. I'm happy to continue expanding on things that I think are useful. Um, happy to touch on things that are maybe more 3D intensive, happy to touch on things that are maybe more Swift UI intensive or store intensive, things like that. That might be helpful for you guys making apps that you're hoping to make some money with. So. Uh, regardless of what you're building, very, very excited to hopefully help you on that journey. Really, really interested to see what you do. And uh, yeah, if you're working on something below, let me know what it is. Always happy to hear more and help when I can. So uh, Caleb Winningham signing off. See you again soon.